In the last few months, we've talked about a number of mysterious cases that remain unsolved until this day. Therefore, in this video, I would like to introduce you to five cases that were at one point considered impossible to crack. However, years later, the truth finally came to light against all odds. Klaus Schelkler and Bettina Texas. In July 1987, the German tourist Klaus Schelkler went on a vacation in Finland together with his girlfriend Bettina Texas. At that time, Klaus was 20 years old and a student. Bettina was 22 years old. On July 28, the two traveled from Stockholm to Turku, a city in Finland, on the ferry Viking Sally. To save money, the two did not rent a cabin but slept in sleeping bags on the outside deck. At 1 am, Klaus and Bettina crawled into their sleeping bags. Around 3.45 am, three young Danes stepped out on the outside deck and found Klaus and Bettina slumped over on the floor. In the dark, their first impression was that the two tourists must have had too much to drink. But upon taking a closer look, they noticed a considerable amount of blood on the ground next to them. The man called for help and attempted to administer first aid to both injured people together with the nurse. Only short time later, the pair was medevaced from the ferry to the closest hospital. Klaus died from his injuries at 6 am the same morning. Bettina survived but was in critical condition. The two had been attacked by a hammer-wielding man during the night. However, unfortunately Bettina is not able to recall any further details from this terrifying incident. The prosecutors would later describe the crime with the words Two innocent victims were targeted in the horrific attack, which was carried out with extreme brutality and cruelty. At that time, there were no security cameras on board, and even though it was clear that the killer had to be among the passengers, they were unable to determine his identity. All exits of the ship were monitored upon disembarking, but there wasn't enough time to question all 1,400 passengers. In the next few years, the case grew cold and was put aside, until authorities made it known that on September 11, 2020, someone had been arrested for the attack. The perpetrator was Thomas N., a Dane who was 18 years old at the time of the crime. One thing that was particularly sick about the whole thing was the fact that he was also one of the three men who had found Klaus and Bettina after the attack, and he had even administered first aid to them. Thomas N. had gotten in trouble with the law quite a few times prior to this incident. Looking back at his life, he spent a total of 19 years in jail. In 2016, he confessed to several other inmates that he was responsible for this crime. When the Finnish police interrogated him, he told them about the murder and the assault. The detectives informed him that Bettina was still suffering from the consequences of his cruel attack even today. That was when he said, the police should tell the woman in Germany that they just talked to the guy who has brought her so much pain all these years ago. When asked about the motive, he simply said, I did it because of something that happened before getting on board of the ferry. The victims simply were at the wrong place at the wrong time. But Thomas was playing a perfidious game. He didn't have legal counsel present when he confessed. That was the reason why the court deemed his confession as invalid. Thomas then knew this. He was openly laughing at the policeman and he was mocking them by saying that the only proof they had came from his own mouth and that he would never confess his crime in presence of his lawyer. He was however, before his death, going to publish a letter in which he would outline every single crime he ever committed. That was a promise. Even though there was a recording of the confession, the Finnish court system would not allow the evidence to be submitted. Thomas himself denied to have committed this crime in front of the court. So Thomas N was not found guilty and has still not paid for his crime until today. Michelle Martinko Michelle Martinko was born on October 6, 1961 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She loved acting and singing and was always described as friendly, happy-go-lucky girl. At 18 years old, in the evening of December 19, 1979, she attended a banquet for the Kennedy Concert Choir, where she wore a black jersey dress, tights and a black scarf. 
After the event, she had asked a friend if she wanted to do a little shopping at the newly opened Westdale Mall. However, her friend declined, so Michelle Martinko went alone. She wanted to purchase a new winter coat. Between 8 and 9 pm, Michelle was recognized by someone working at the mall jewelry store. But when Michelle didn't make it home by midnight, her father called the police. They immediately set out to find Michelle and promptly spotted her car, which was parked in the mall parking lot. Michelle's lifeless body was found slumped over on the passenger seat. Her face and neck were covered with 29 stab wounds. Michelle must have put up a fight, because she also had numerous defensive wounds all over her hands. News of the crime spread through the small town like wildfire. Investigators were completely puzzled by the circumstances. Michelle's entire money was still in the car. She also hadn't been sexually assaulted and there was no trace of fingerprints. There was a 10,000 reward for tip to police. In the weeks after, the police received more than 200 calls. However, all of them led to disappointment. Sadly, Michelle's parents no longer had the chance to see this case get solved. Her father Albert passed away in 1995 and her mother Janet died in 1998. In 2006, they received another tip in Michelle's case. Even though it didn't lead to anything, it at least caused investigators to take another look at the case file. They reviewed every little detail and then noticed that someone else's blood was also located at the scene. But at the time the crime had occurred, DNA technology had not been very advanced. So they ran the DNA against their database. However, without any luck. After that, the investigation stalled again, until 2018. That's when the DNA was ran against the database of the website GetMatch, which is a public genealogy service. Cold case investigators resort to this measure from time to time to find new leads in their case. This is when they located a woman who, based on the DNA, had to be a second cousin to the killer. When looking closer into her family background, investigators were able to narrow it down to three brothers. In the next few weeks, police were secretly surveilling them. On October 29, 2018, the investigators observed that one of the brothers, Jerry Lynn Burns, was drinking lemonade from a plastic straw. They collected the straw and compared the DNA on it to the blood found on Michelle's clothes. It was a match. Further tests proved that the other two brothers were not involved. Burns was taken to the police station to be interrogated. He claimed to have no idea how his DNA showed up at the scene of the crime. Another DNA sample was then taken from him. According to the detectives, Burns didn't get upset or showed emotions during the interview, even when they told him that he was under arrest. When asked if he truly killed someone that night in 1979, he completely rejected the idea and continuously told investigators, test the DNA and you will know. However, when the second sample was tested, the lab came to the same conclusion. It was a match to the DNA found in the car. An evaluation of Burns' computer revealed that he regularly visited websites where women were raped, stabbed or strangled. On December 19, 2018, exactly 39 years after Martinko's brutal killing, Burns was arrested and charged with murder. He pleaded not guilty. The trial dragged on, but Burns was ultimately found guilty on August 7, 2020 and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Sabrina Elm Sabrina Elm was four years old when she was kidnapped by her own mother on April 21, 2002. Sabrina was living with her father, Greg Elm, who had custody of her. Her mother, Dara Lawrence, was allowed to see her daughter on weekends, which is when the little girl was staying with her. Dara was not happy with the custody arrangement. Time and time again, she claimed that Greg was abusing the child. Police and investigators from Children and Youth Services were looking into these accusations and soon realized that Dara was lying. This is when the court ordered Dara to do therapy. In the months leading up to Sabrina's disappearance, Dara had repeatedly threatened to take her daughter and disappear. On April 21, 2002, she simply didn't bring Sabrina back to her father's house. Greg alerted police immediately and Dara's house was searched. But Sabrina and her mother had vanished while the car was still parked out front. Nobody knew where the two had gone. More than a year later, in June 2003, investigators found a lead that pointed to Mexico. Witnesses claimed to have seen the pair in a house in Mexico City. 
Police searched the house, finding clothing and personal belongings that clearly belonged to Dara and Sabrina. However, the two had managed to flee and avoid police. The witnesses also stated that Dara had dyed her own hair blonde and her daughter's hair black. In the following years, there were no new leads regarding Sabrina's whereabouts. Her father Greg had built countless connections to Mexico to help him keep an eye out for his daughter. On October 1st, 2014, one of these contacts tipped police off, which led to the authorities being able to locate Dara and Sabrina after 12 long years. The FBI stormed their house in Lakshkala, a city about one and a half hours from Mexico City. Dara was arrested, and the then 16-year-old Sabrina was supposed to go back to her father. But Dara had spent many years telling her that Greg was a bad man who had abused and beaten her and her mother. It took several months for Sabrina to be able to trust her father again. Greg was very ecstatic to rebuild his relationship with his daughter. He was finally able to hold his daughter, whom he had been desperately looking for over so many years, in his arms again. On March 30th, 2016, Dara was sentenced to 8 years in prison for felony child abduction. Blanca Ortiz Blanca was 43 years old when she disappeared from her hometown Leon in Spain. At the age of 21, she had previously immigrated to Spain from Argentina with her parents and two younger brothers. Prior to her disappearance in 1995, Blanca had an argument with her father. She left her place of employment that day and vanished without a trace. Her father only reported her missing two years later. Shortly after, the police tracked her down in the city of Gion, but Blanca supposedly stated that she wanted to break all ties with her family and never speak to them again. Her brothers didn't believe this to be true and immediately traveled to Gion to find her. However, they were unsuccessful in doing so. A full decade later, in 2005, Blanca's father was on his deathbed. He and his sons were full of hope that Bianca would come home now, but she didn't. Instead, she sent a letter with a photo of herself, saying how sorry she was, but that she still couldn't come back home. She promised to contact her younger brothers again soon though, but that didn't happen, not even after her father had passed away. The years went by, and her brother still believed that Bianca was either being kept against her will or that she had passed away. In their eyes, this was the only possible reason why she hadn't reached out to them again. At the end of August 2020, a couple from La Fresnada in Spain called the police. They hadn't seen their 60-year-old neighbor Eva for a while, and that was not typical for her, as you could usually see her outside, looking after the children and the animals around the neighborhood. Police investigated and found the 60-year-old slumped over on a chair in her living room. She was still alive, but severely dehydrated and confused. When they took her to the hospital, they noticed that there was no woman by her name on the census, and nobody else was registered under her name either. The woman, who had called her safe Eva all of these years, then confessed that her real name was Blanca, and that she was living under a fake name so that she could not be found. Since that time in 2020, Blanca has reunited with her brothers and is back living with them. Jose Luis, one of her brothers, said in an interview, I am so happy that she's back with us. We used to be a very tight-knit family, and then, suddenly, particularly overnight, she just left. What made her do it? Well, I can only imagine that she acted upon impulse. Maybe because of the fight with my father, my mother, or myself. I'm not sure. She had always seemed so happy, until the day she just picked up and left. And we didn't know where her sister was, for all of these years. Daniela Poggialli Daniela Poggialli was a nurse from Italy. In 2014, Manuela Alzi visited the hospital where Daniela worked. Her mother had been a patient there for some time. But after spending only a few minutes with her mother, Daniela entered and asked Manuela to please leave the room, so that she could give Manuela's mother her treatment. Manuela had a strange feeling about that, but obeyed and waited outside until Daniela was done. When she went back into her mother's room, she noticed a small glass vial on her drip. Manuela didn't question it at first, but when her mother died just an hour later, she insisted on an investigation to find out what medication had been given to her in that vial. And sure enough, a blood test found potassium chloride in her body. That was determined to be the cause of death. It was pure luck that this could still be identified at all, 
because after a few hours, potassium chloride is typically no longer detectable in the blood. Manuela Alci pressed charges against Daniela Pugliali, and this brought to light the gruesome truth. In the past few years, Daniela had been known around the hospital as the angel of death because the patients had a high mortality rate. At first, only the oldest ones of her patients were passing away, which is why nobody grew suspicious. But then colleagues began to notice that in the past two years at least 93 patients had died while under her care. That was four times more than under her colleagues. But when Daniela was questioned about it, she just brushed it off and cited bad luck. And before Manuela's mother's death, toxicology reports could never prove anything. Another nurse now came forward and stated that she had caught Daniela stealing a few times. But when she threatened to tell on her, Daniela had placed funeral arrangements all over her car. The other nurse took that as a threat and was too afraid to say anything. In an evaluation of the last few months, it was noticeable that the hospital's death rate rose whenever Daniela was working. If she was on vacation or out sick, the rate dropped again. More of Daniela's colleagues were now brave enough to come forward. They said Daniela sedated patients who were annoying her so that she could have a quiet shift. And when authorities checked Daniela's cell phone, they found countless pictures of her with a big grin on her face while posing next to deceased patients. When asked about these pictures, Daniela said, This wasn't my idea. My coworker who took the pictures came up with this. Also, I never imagined that these pictures would be seen by anyone. They were private, just between me and her. I admit taking the picture was a mistake, but that doesn't mean that I killed someone. I always lived my life wanting to help others. Daniela was arrested and charged. Her trial took place in 2016. Although it was assumed that she killed at least 36 people, the only one that they had proof for was the murder of Manuela Salsi's mother. Nevertheless, Daniela was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. Daniela herself didn't seem particularly impressed. She relished in the attention of the press and smiled at every camera that was pointed at her. But after the verdict, Daniela and her lawyers filed an appeal. They invited a coroner to testify, who stated that Ms. Alsi's death should have occurred within minutes, and that her passing more than an hour later could not have been caused by the potassium chloride. The Court of Appeals had to admit that the evidence they had was not enough to keep Daniela in prison. In 2019, Almost three years into her sentence, she was released. In her first interview after that, she said, You've made me out to be someone I'm not, and now I will be able to have my life back. But it didn't take long for Daniela to be charged with the same crime again. In 2014, a 95-year-old named Massimo Montari had died in the hospital that she worked in. In his case, there was also potassium chloride located in his blood. It just wasn't clear who had given it to him and why. Now Massimo's family contacted police and told them that he knew Daniela prior to the hospital stay already. At one point they had gotten into an argument and Daniela threatened that he should watch out and better make sure that she would never get her hands on him. When his relatives found out about Daniela's arrest, it was clear to them that she had to be responsible for Massimo's death as well. Daniela Pugliali was found guilty again in court. Although she could not be sentenced to life in prison, she received a 30-year prison sentence. And this brings us to the end of today's video. I hope you enjoyed this video, which was a little bit different from my others. Leave me a comment and let me know what you like better. Cases that are still unsolved today because you enjoy making your own assumptions, or cases that are solved and closed. Feel free to check out one of these two playlists, which you can see right here. Either a collection of unsolved cases, or cases that could be solved, depending on what kind of videos you prefer. If you liked the video, then leave us a thumbs up or subscribe to my channel. Thank you in advance, and I appreciate you for watching. I will see you again for the next video. Good night and see you soon.